it's Helen Horto here, the diary reader. Let's get into some diary reading. Hi everybody, we'll get straight into it. Okay, so my, um, excuse the background noise, because my husband's doing his <laughs> podcast at the same time. So I'll try not to be, so if I sound like I'm sort of whispering, it's so that he can't hear me, but I can hear him because it's so loud. Anyway, um, so we'll go to the 29th of July, 1991, and at the top of my diary I've written happy birthday at the top of the diary entry, and whose birthday is it? It's mine, of course. So I've, I've written, dear diary, today I didn't feel any older or bigger. I am 14 years old. It was just a normal day. Okay, so that's all I've written for uh, the 29th of July. Um, the 30th of July I've put in um, Today nothing exciting happened Rach gave me some chocolates and a card And a cap for my birthday And it had LA on it I was very happy I finished reading The Moon Knight Oh sorry I finished reading um, Then Moon by Night Or The Moon by Night By Madeline Leangle It was very good Okay, so on the 1st of August 91, I've written after school when I went to the bookshop, I was very sad to see that it had closed. So it was, I felt really sad. It was all dark and cold inside. Now the reason why I am sad is because um, the bookstore was one of my favorite stores. So for it to be um, now closed, uh, that meant I couldn't go and and look at the book set I would hopefully <laughs> buy one day <laughs> no but like when I did get money um, I actually saved it so I could buy some books okay which is a, a surprise because everybody knows how much I love food but when it came you know if it's a choice between books or food it's books hands down books because um, with books at least you can reread it like you know once you've eaten the food it's gone that's it, the food's gone, but books, you have them forever. Uh, okay, so the 2nd of August, 1991. Today, Rach and I went to seminary. It was all right. Tomorrow, we have a readathon starting at 6 a.m. to 12. Hmm, a readathon. Okay, so at music, we watched the rest of Amadeus. Amadeus, it was really good. I felt sorry for Mozart, but I reckon Ellery was a very wicked man. Okay, so I don't actually remember the movie, but yeah, I didn't like Ellery. Okay, 3rd of August, 91. Um, today we had our readathon. Rach and I really enjoyed it. It was excellent. When we got home, Ula was making some food. And Auntie Malemo sent us some massive t-shirts. I got a black rusta t-shirt. It was really cool. I remember that t-shirt as well. I really loved it. Okay, 4th of August. Today we visited Tilo May in the hospital. Oh, yes, actually. Um, sending out my love to our Nasul family. Because um, our beautiful, their beautiful mum, our Auntie Telesi, uh, she passed away. So sending all our love to the Nasul family. So I've, I've written in here that we've um, visited Tilo May in hospital, I'm not sure, she must have been sick. And then I've noted that we've dropped Eve, Eva and Nicholas off home. So Eva, our older sister, and her son Nicholas. And I finished reading The Golden Girl. Mm, okay, don't remember The Golden Girl. Uh, the 5th of August, today we, uh, sorry. Okay, the 5th of August, today was another stink day at school, it was really boring. At seminary, we found that the church had been broken into and a TV and computer and some other stuff had been stolen. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it wasn't actually the church, the chapel had been broken into. Okay, the 6th of August. Now, at the top of this diary entry, I've written, Oops Day. So let's see what Oops Day is all about. Okay. And maybe, maybe you've had an oops day. So please comment below 
if you've had one of these oops days and I'm going to read what the oops day is. Okay, so today was another stink day at school. I don't know why I keep saying that the days were stink. Anyway, I'll carry on. So I've said I enjoyed PE, maths, English and music, but the weather was stink. Okay, so maybe that's what I mean when I say it was a stink day, that the weather was ugly or something. But the best part I liked today was when all our class was bunched up next to the door and this is a crush and my crush came in front of me and walked past and he bumped into me and then he said oops sorry was he really sorry though really okay I think he did it on purpose because there was room at the back of me for him to walk past Geez, he's a spunk. And then I've written, was it an accident? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's so funny, so me being a 14-year-old, thinking, well, I'm a new 14-year-old. And now I'm, 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 I'm trying to say, it wasn't really an accident. He really wanted to bump into me. But that's okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, 7th of August, I've written down, um, Galafu. Ola and Faye just dropped us off home from MIA not so long ago. So this was our youth activity nights. So we've gotten a ride home. It was good. We had cooking. We baked a chocolate cake and it tasted all right. Today was Rachel's school's awesome August, but I didn't go. I don't even know what that is, but I've written that I didn't go. Okay, um, now... So we don't get too bored with my diary entries, I'm just going to break it up and I'm going to share with you um, the story of a lady by the name of Corrie Ten Boom. Um, now, so her name is actually Cornelia. So I listened to a documentary while I watched a documentary on Corrie Ten Boom and that's how they pronounce her name. But it's probably because of their accent, and maybe they called Corrie Coronelia with their accent. Whereas, you know, here in New Zealand, it's Cornelia. So maybe we would call her Corrie instead of Corrie. But to the, um, the guy that was um, doing the, the presenter for the documentary, he referred to her as Corrie. So I'll just say Corrie as well. Okay, so Corrie, um, she was born in the Netherlands in 1892, and her parents were Casper and Cornelia uh, Ten Boom. So Casper and Cornelia, they were both dedicated Christians, um, and their family uh, values were firmly rooted in the Bible. So Father, I'll just call Casper the father, Father Ten Boom. So, um, so Father Ten Boom, he read from the Bible daily, and it sounds like they're their family, like they were what, really fully immersed and um, they had discussions, good discussions on what they'd learnt in the Bible. Okay, so when I watched this documentary, I actually took notes so that I could share with you um, the life of this wonderful lady. Okay, so Father Ten Boom, he was highly respected in the local community and then Mother Ten Boom, she was, she was known for her work with the less fortunate. Uh, so they lived in a typical Dutch house, which they referred to as the Baye house. Um, and this, this house had three stories and it was a tall and narrow building. Um, it's also doubled as their house and a watch store. So the watch store, so because it was three stories, so the watch store was the first um, story and then the other two um, stories were their living quarters. Um, okay. Okay, so the original house, um, the Baye house, it was built in the 1600s. Oh, I feel like I've missed like a whole page here. I best make sure. Okay, so when their two elderly aunts moved in with them, they needed more space. 
So um, Father Tim Boom, he ended up buying the house next door. So their original house, which is the Bayet house, um, it was built in the 1600s, whereas the house next door that they'd just bought, it was actually bought in the, I mean, it was built in the 1400s and it had two stories and there was an alley between the two houses. So what they did was that they joined the two houses and they built a middle section um, which which used which used to be the alleyway um, because the Bay A house had three stories and the house next door had two stories um, the different levels made the joining of the two houses quite unique so it was a bit interesting and confusing at the same time however the mismatched joining of the two houses ended up being a blessing and you'll find out why soon Okay, um, so Cory, she had aspirations to be happily married, and unfortunately, that dream was shattered when the man that she loved, he showed up to visit her with his fiance. Like, who does that? Anyway, now because because Cory's social standing didn't meet his mum's expectations for a future wife, he ended up with someone else. So as you can imagine, poor Cory, you know, she would have been so heartbroken. You know, she loved this guy. And, um, yeah, he ended up marrying someone else. Anyway, so, um, you know, as soon as they left, uh, Cory was so upset that she went to her room. And her father, Father Tim Boom, he comforted and he counseled his daughter. Um, and he said to her, and I'm quoting what he said, he said, Love is the strongest force in the world. And when it's taken away, it hurts very deeply. The important thing to do is to find another channel through which love can travel. So Father Ten Boom, he sounds like um, he was such a loving and kind father to his children. And it wasn't unusual for him to bond with his daughter or any of his children. So he sounds like he was quite close to all his kids. I imagine that due to Corrie's uh, close relationship to her father, uh, that she felt comforted and probably grateful that she had someone like her father to um, support, comfort and counsel her. And um, as a parent myself, I know how important it is for us to be able to build a strong relationship with our own children so that, you know, when they have challenges, um, that we are able to um, support and comfort them that we're in a position where the relationship is so good and strong that they're comfortable, they're open to um, hearing our counsel as we give it to them. Um, and another thing I've learnt, you know, I'm not the perfect parent and I never will be, but um, one thing that I've learnt from older, wiser parents is that um, we need to talk less and listen more. So definitely trying to take that on board. Okay, uh, so Corrie goes on to write that, um, and this is what she says, It was as if my heart was broken that moment, and after they had gone, I went straight to my room, and I said, Lord Jesus, I belong to you, lock, stock, and barrel. I surrender this part of my being that is wounded. I've had a, and then she goes on to say, I've had a very happy life, and Jesus has taken care of me. I've never become a frustrated old spinster, but I had, but I had to surrender my if only. So I interpret her, you know, when she says I, I had to surrender my if only, um, I interpret that to mean that she wasn't, she wasn't going to dwell or waste energy on thinking, you know, about the if only I did this or if only I did that. Um, you know, I get what she's saying um, because I've come across many people who have dwelled on their if onlys, like if only I had done this, you know, things would have been this way, if only I had done that, you know, things would have turned out this, that way, you know, and, and so on. Um, and, you know, I find that these people, um, they end up, you know, being stuck and they can't move on. 
So if you're stuck in a if only state, um, I would encourage you to to let it go and to move forward. You know, and it's it's easy for me to say to let it go, but you really need to try and let it go and move forward because you know all that's happening is you're wasting all this time and energy on thinking about if only. You know, that's that's wasted time, and it's time that could be spent. Um, on you setting new goals and working on those goals and working to achieve those goals okay so yeah sorry getting getting back on track so I love how Corrie knows that she has to surrender her if only because she knows the dangers and the setbacks that come if you hold on to those if onlys so after making that decision Corrie never looked back she was convinced that God had a greater purpose for her life um, and yeah I can just feel like how strong Corrie's faith is and what a strong and faithful Christian she was so Corrie went on to dedicate her time to caring for her two elderly aunts uh, Corrie and her sister Betsy they nursed them right up until they passed away now the two sisters also worked with the youth groups um, in the city and they hosted Bible study classes and Corrie she even started up a club for the handicapped um, I don't know if we we call it handicapped but in her um, in her writings she she's put in there that she started up a club for the handicapped and she taught them from the Bible and she even wrote a book titled common sense not needed bringing the gospel to the mentally handicapped so she had a great love um, for uh, these brothers and sisters. Okay, so in 1918, um, her mum was bedridden and she suffered a cerebral, a cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, so that meant that Betsy took on the housework and Corrie took her mum's place um, as the watch store assistant to Father Ten Boom. And it was here that um, it was here that that they discovered that Corrie was quite a good businesswoman so she had um, good management skills and the family's business um, started thriving and it did um, better financially due to Corrie's um, management and skills okay so Corrie be actually became Holland's first licensed female um, watch Hang on. Okay, so Corrie became Holland's first licensed female watchmaker. Woohoo, go Corrie! Um, so she travelled to Switzerland to do a course on watchmaking and watch repair. And she did this under the Swiss. And I'm assuming that the Swiss were uh, leaders in the watch industry then and prob probably still now. And on her return, she became Father Ten Boom's main helper. So in 1921, Mother Ten Boom passed away. However, due to the family's faith, they were comforted to know that um, they'd have a happy reunion with their mum again. Um, now, with the house being empty, now this is a big house, and just the three of them, the Ten Booms wanted to do more for those in need. So they were very missionary-minded um, and focused. Um, so they had uh, missionaries coming through the house. Now, um, so even though war was looming in Europe, the Netherlands um, were a bit untouched until Germany invaded the Netherlands on the 10th of May 1940. And within weeks, life changed drastically for everyone in, Europe, um, in Holland. So the German government took over and put their rules into place. They confiscated all the radios in Netherlands. And they didn't want anyone to have information about the war. Um, the Ten Boons managed to keep one hidden under the main stairs in their house. And during the night, they would gather and listen to the news from London. Um, so at the beginning of the war, their queen and the royal family, um, they had to flee to London and they sought refuge there. So listening to their queen's speeches broadcast from London gave them hope and courage. So at the same time, they also heard um, Hitler's speeches. 
and Curry described his voice as getting louder and louder and higher and higher as he pro as he progressed in his speeches. She said in the end, his voice was the voice of a demon. And yeah, I agree with her. He was a demon. Not only was his voice a demon, he was a demon. Anyway, um, at first, the persecution of the Jews wasn't that no noticeable. But as time went by, they saw their Jewish friends being picked out, forced to wear the Star of David. Their shops were targeted, their houses raided, and, and eventually they were rounded up. On one occasion, um, a neighbouring Jewish shop was attacked, and Father Ten Boom and Corrie, they pulled um, their neighbour into their home, and then they contacted um, her brother Wilhelm, Wilhelm and his son Kik, who, um, who found safe places for Jews to hide. And a few weeks later, she bumped into her nephew Kik, and she asked him um, how her neighbour was. And his response was that she needed to, and I quote, stop asking lots of questions if she wanted to continue being part of the Dutch underground resistance. And um, she, was, she was quite shocked when she heard um, him say this. And she shared it with her father and Betsy. And now they were faced with a dilemma. So their Christian faith motivated them um, to help people. However, the idea of being part of the resistance seemed too political for them. Um, so the, the turning point came when a man showed up to the Baye house with an orphaned local Jewish baby. Now the local pastor was unwilling to take the child due to the personal risk and dire consequences that would follow. So he refused to take the child. So Father Ten Boom was appalled by this and he didn't hesitate to take the child. And Betsy and Cory supported their, their father's decision and they would go on to risk their lives in order to save many others. Now that decision by Father Ten Boom um, it speaks volumes about the, the sort or the type of man that he was. So the consequences could have meant that he risked not only his own life but the life of his family. So some people might say that this is risky or even blatantly stupid but knowing what I know of him now, he truly was a man of God. Um, a man who had love and compassion and he trusted God. I feel that he was the sort of person who tried, up to, um, who tried to live up to his Christian beliefs um, as best as he could, regardless of the consequences. Um, and that he believed that whatever happened, happened. That the Lord would bless him and that if it was his time to go then it was his time to go but that he would do everything in his power to live a christ-like life now these are the types of people i look up to and aspire to be like um, what a great man and a man of god he was i love that man i've never met him but i've met him through um Corey's, um documentary um, so Corey's experience in working with and organizing youth groups came in handy because she was able to get 30 teenage boys, 20 teenage girls, 20 men and 10 women together um, once they had heard the news that all the Jewish babies in a um, Jewish orphanage in Amsterdam were going to be killed due to being Jewish. Now, um, can you keep the noise down with your ball please? I'm in the middle of a recording. Okay, sorry, carrying on. So the teenage, I love this, so the teenage boys said, and I quote, we will save them and we will steal them. Amazing, what an amazing attitude coming from these young men. And they went to that orphanage and they stole all 100 babies. That's a miracle. Okay, so Corey says, it was only possible due to some good German army soldiers contacting them and saying that they no longer wanted to work for Adolf Hitler 
they refused to kill the Jewish people and they asked Cory if they could help them. So Cory jumped at the opportunity and Cory says um, they gave them their civilian clothes and the soldiers gave them their uniforms and that's how they were able to get the babies out to safety. But yeah, again, the courage of those youth, how awesome, eh? That's, that's the sort of youth that we need, that we want. Um, so, you know, these youth, they were more concerned about saving the lives of these babies um, rather than thinking of their own lives and the consequences. Oh, I also loved how these soldiers, um, they stood up for their beliefs, um, which again would have been very, or may have been very hard for them to do at the time, um, because again, they would have suffered harsh penalties for their, un, um, for their insubordination. However, again, the overriding theme here is the need to help and preserve the lives of others regardless of the consequences to themselves. Now I know that there were thousands of soldiers during World War II who faced these same ugly challenges um, as they witnessed Hitler's quest to annihilate the Jewish people. Mm. Okay, so Father Ten Boom, he um, welcomed anyone and everyone to um, the Ten Boom the Ten Boom house, Jewish or not. So the Ten Booms had a special, um, they had a soft spot for the for their uh, Jewish brothers and sisters. So it didn't take long for the Jews to show up at the Ten Booms door um, because they knew that they would be supported and they were desperate and they sought shelter and refuge at the Ten Booms. So mothers with young children would show up, young people, the elderly, and no one was ever turned away. So the Ten Booms lived in the centre of Harlem, near the police station, and with all the activity going on at their house, they figured um, the, only, the only reason that no police had shown up was because um, they were still, still loyal to the Queen. Otherwise, the operation of acting as a safe house for the Jews wouldn't have lasted for as long as it did. So the Ten Booms suspected uh, their, acti their activities were known to the police. Um, okay, so back then, being in the war, the food was rationed, meaning families were issued full, uh, food rations by the government. So the Ten Booms were issued only three ration cards um, for their ha household. But, you know, as we know, they had a lot more than just three mouths to feed, especially, you know, now that they're acting a as a safe house um, for Jews. So a guy by the name of Fred Kunstra, um, he used to be the, the Ten Booms electric meter reader. He was given a position at the food office and um, Corey took the risk of going to ask Fred um, for some ration cards. So even though despite not being sure um, of whether a Fred would be open to giving her extra ration cards, you know, she just went there and she boldly asked him um, for a hundred ration cards and to, to her relief Fred actually agreed so there's a good man there Fred good man okay so Fred's challenge was how was he going to account for the 100 ration cards to his Nazi supervisor so Fred devised a plan to fake a robbery and he got his friend to beat him up um, to, to to make it look so well, to make his alibi seem more convincing, and it's worked. And again, um, you know, I'm grateful for the Freds during during the war um, for the sacrifice he made because because of him, um, the Jews that were in hiding at the Ten Booms they were able to be fed, um, 
and you know if their families had survived the Holocaust, the Holocaust um, then um, Fred had a hand in helping to um, sustain them and keep them alive just through you know the little the little thing that he did which wasn't actually a little thing so just to put it into perspective it was estimated that uh, six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust and you know if you think about NZ the population is about five million so that's the whole of NZ gone with an extra million on top of that um, so today you know we might scratch our heads and think you know how did that happen you know how did people let that happen and could that happen again so hopefully not and you know I don't want to get all political and stuff but you know if we if we can really see what's happening in the world today um, you know you can subtly see the segregation that's happening with the vaccinated versus unvaccinated um, so you know the vaccinated here in NZ we get their special privileges whereas if you're unvaccinated you know you can't go to certain places because you're unvaccinated so just keep an eye out for that because you know that is the beginning of some serious stuff um, and if we don't remember the lessons from the Holocaust um, you know history could repeat itself I think that we need to do and lots of us are already doing is that we need to be respectful and respect other people's um, choices their rights and don't discriminate against somebody because they're vaxxed or unvaxxed or whatever um, and if someone's being mistreated then you know stand up and say something about it okay back to the 10 booms okay so for months the 10 booms were able to move their Jewish um, friends um, the refugees to other locations in secret the 10 booms also feared that their phone was being tapped so they had a code for when Jews needed to go into hiding at their house so what would happen is that if somebody needed to go into, how, um, into hiding um, somebody would make a call to the 10 booms and they would say this is the code um, they would say I have a watch that needs to be repaired um, which was code for another Jewish person person will be arriving soon um, to go into hiding so the other code they had um, to warn the person who was coming in for hiding was that they would place this um, wooden triangle um, looking plaque thing in the window and if the face of the tri triangle with the writing on it faced the window like faced out to the window so you could read the words um, that meant it was safe to enter the store and come in um, to hiding but if the back of the triangle with no writing was facing the shop window um, that meant you know don't come in it's not safe for you to enter so that was their code okay and um, because they had a few Jews in hiding uh, to keep the house guests occupied the 10 booms created a work schedule and activities for them so Cory describes it as she says it was just like having she says it was just like having um, a big family working together um, yeah so that's that's pretty clever because I suppose it helped to maintain um, maintain some type of normality in an already turmoil world for them so not only did it keep them busy but maybe it, it helped to keep their minds off or a bit less on the fate of their loved ones and working together fosters a sense of unity and love among people in the best and worst of times so um, things actually did become more challenging um, several times for the 10 booms so Corrie's uh, nephews and even her sister Nolly were arrested, imprisoned and then released. 
here. So the possibility of a raid on the Baye house was very real and it was becoming very dangerous for everyone and um, those hiding in the Ten Booms um, house at the time. So because, um, you know, because of that impending danger, they decided that they needed um, to build a hiding place and it needed to be a place somewhere in the house furthest from the doors closest to the street. So this place ended up being Corrie's um, own bedroom. Uh, okay, so Corrie's bedroom was at the top of the stairs. So this would give the Jews more time to go straight to the hiding place before the Nazis got to the top of the stairs. Now they suspected that the Nazis would search pardon me they suspected the Nazis would search every room starting from the bottom floor and that it would take them longer to get to the top of the stairs um, but to give the Jews more time to get into their hiding place so in Corrie's bedroom um, the wall was built into the ceiling and the floor and you're probably thinking and okay so I'll tell you the reason why this was a good thing this meant that if the Nazis were to bang on the walls, listening for hollow spots in the walls, um, that if they were to bang on Corrie's wall, they would only hear um, that it was solid due to how it was constructed. Okay, so in Corrie's room, there was also built a, um, a linen closet, and under the lowest shelf in the linen closet, um, was a an entrance into a hiding spot and in front of the entrance Corey normally just put a suitcase there and um, when people did go into hiding in there um, they would remain in there for up to 48 hours and it was able to hold up to six people and it also had a small um, vent opening area just at the top of that hiding place um, so once the Jews once the Jews went into hiding, they wouldn't be able to leave the house um, because it was too dangerous. So there was a balcony type area uh, they could go on. So that was nice. So the ten booms um, they laid some straw mattresses um, on the balconies for them, but they had to lay low in order to not be seen. Um, yeah, so that was that was good for them because you know being locked up in a, a little space at least they were able to get out and get some fresh air and sun but again they had to lie low um, the ten booms they also installed several buzzers around the house to warn occupants of any danger or threats and um, they even practiced drills and these drills came in very handy um, yeah it was it was the difference it made the difference so Corrie would, uh, so during the drill, so Corrie would press the buzzer nearest to her and everyone would spring into action. So the table was reset to make it to look like there was, um, there were only three people eating. Uh, the others would rush up the stairs, grab their belongings. They couldn't leave any signs or evidence to raise uh, suspicions that others were living there. So if someone was sleeping, they'd have to flip the mattress over to ensure no warm spots were on the bed um, they couldn't give anything away because you know any of those small details meant life or death for everybody um, okay so the aim was to be hidden oh the aim the aim of the drills was to ensure that everybody had done all of that stuff and were in the room within one minute and they perfected those drills and eventually like I said it's all paid off but that's pretty impressive like in one minute doing all of that like making everything look like you know there was just the three people living there getting rid of all their stuff taking yeah I don't know where they put it but then and then um, getting up into that room on the third story and into um, the hiding the hiding place yes so jewels do pay off so in Feb 1944, Corrie was sick with influenza for several days. 
a man by the name of John Vogel came to um, the door and he begged Corey to help him free his wife who was arrested for, uh, for saving Jewish people. So his wife was at the police station and one of the, the police officers um, said he was um, he would risk setting her free for 600 guilders. So I'm not sure what that's equivalent to in NZ or Australian dollars or US dollars. So Corey goes on to say that uh, she helped him and yeah, yeah. So she went on to help him but she does say that he was a betrayer. So at the same time, um, her brother Wilhelm was there holding a Bible study class. Um, the Jewish people were there and Cory was still unwell and sleeping in her room. So at 5 p.m. Um, at 5 p.m. the doorbell rang. Betsy went to answer and she answered the door and she was pushed back by the Nazis and luckily there was a buzzer near the door which she pressed and we all know what the buzzer means so Corrie was awakened when the guests burst into her room and into the hiding place and due to the unusual layout of the Bay A house this slowed the Nazis down okay so um, the guests or their Jewish um, brothers and sisters they knew what the buzzer meant and they sprung into action and and just put into practice the drills that they had practiced. Okay, um, okay. So Corey later attributed um, this to God's providence. When she's referring to this, she's referring to the unusual layout of the houses that were now joined together. So um, you know, these are just my thoughts. Sometimes. So the joining, so remembering that the joining of the two houses, the the the, the three, three story house, the Bay A house, and the house next door, the two story house, and then they joined it with um, a middle part, and because you know because the the layout of the house was now a bit strange and unusual, um, Corey's saying that um, due to this unusual layout. It helped to slow the Nazis down in their search and she says that this is God's providence so sometimes we don't understand things right away like this house being a bit unusual but you know it can make sense to us later so purchasing the two-story house next door and joining to joining it to the Bay A house you know it ended up being a blessing and a lifesaver for many of those people um, that went into hiding in the Bay A house yeah and you know sometimes we have those moments sometimes we things happen in our lives where we're like you know what i don't get why this is happening or why this is the way that it is and it's not until maybe years later months later um that we actually click and we actually see um like Corey did providence like we see okay yeah i get i get why that's happened Mm, anyway, carrying on. So by the time the Nazis arrived to Corrie's room, she was sitting up and they accused her of being the ringleader of the Bay A and they demanded that she disclose where the Jews were hiding. Uh, she played dumb and they slapped her around and they and then they took her to a truck which was waiting, which yeah, a truck that was waiting for um, to take them away. So she was horrified to see that her sister Betsy and her nephew um, were bruised and bleeding, so they'd been beaten up. And a Nazi officer gave Father Ten Boom the option to remain at home on the condition that he didn't uh, cause any more trouble. But he refused. He's like, nope. So he was thrown into the truck and taken away. Uh, you know, when I heard that part, I thought... That Nazi officer, um, you know, he had a heart. He must have had a heart because, you know, he. it sounds to me, this is my own opinion, it sounds to me, are you right? I'm in the middle of some recording. Yeah, leave it there. A little bit, open a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Main at home. <laughs>
and apologies, my phone actually died on me and I'm not sure what happened. And my daughter reckons it was because I was talking too much. I think I was up to the part where the Nazi officer gave Father Ten Boom the option to remain at home. The option to remain at home um, as on the condition that he didn't cause any trouble and Father Ten Boom uh, refused and they, they threw him in the truck and he was taken away. So my thoughts on that Nazi officer is that um, you know maybe he probably knew what would happen to Father Ten Boom and maybe this was his way of trying to spare Father Ten Boom um, for what he knew he would be up against. Okay, so Cory found that they were betrayed by the same man that she helped, uh, John Vogel. So they were taken from the police station, then to the prison in Scheveningen um, on the Dutch coast, and it was there that Cory and Betsy um, saw their father for the last time. So they were lined up with their noses against the wall, and Father Ten Boom he quoted Psalms uh, chapter no, uh, 91 verse 1 and sadly that was the last time that they saw their father. Actually I better check that one. It was Psalm, I mean I've written here Psalms 91 verse 1 but I'm not sure if that's the actual, if that was the actual um, verse. So I may have made an error but I will put it in the description box below if it was the wrong one. So upon medical examination, Corrie was found to have pleurisy. I'm not sure what pleurisy is. And because um, they didn't want her to infect the other, the other prisoners, um, she ended up being put in her own cell, which meant that she was separated for the first time from her sister, Betsy. And um, so Corrie, she was actually placed in solitary confinement. So she had no knowledge of what was happening to her family or those in hiding at her home. Um, so this is very hard for Corrie not knowing what was happening. So weeks later, and on her 52nd birthday, uh, Corrie received a letter from her sister, Nolly. And um, she informed Corrie that their father had passed away 10 days after being imprisoned. So his body had been placed in an unmarked grave and so they didn't even know where he was buried. But Corrie was comforted to know that her father was in heaven. Um, and he used to say to them all the time, our times are in God's hands. And I'm guessing he meant, you know, when it's time for you to go, it's your time to go. So Corrie noticed that the writing on the envelope was slightly slanted um, carefully toward the stamp. So she peeled the stamp off and in, and in Dutch it said, all the watches are safe. So if we go back and remember earlier um, that that was code when they were referring to um, watches that needed to be repaired. That meant that um, one of their Jewish friends needed uh, a safe place to hide. So she's her sister's um, letting her know through code that um, those that were in the house um, when it was raided, that they were safe. So all the Jewish guests were safe. Um, so Cory was repeatedly interrogated. Um, so while she was in prison, she was repeatedly interrogated. And she testified of her faith and it's brought her Dutch interrogator close to a conversion and uh, this is what she says now I'm quoting what she says she says when I was in prison I once was brought before my judge and my life was in the hands of that man and when we testify to our faith the Lord touched the heart of that judge and instead of an enemy, he became a friend, but he had to do his job. And so it happened that suddenly he showed me papers found in my house. And to my horror, I saw names, addresses and particulars that could mean 
not only my death sentence, but the death sentence of my family and friends who were in prison. The judge said, can you explain these papers? I said, no, I can't. And I felt terrible, terrible, unhappy, is what she says. But he knew better than I how dangerous the papers were. And he turned and opened the door of the stove and threw all the papers into the flames. Into the flames. How happy I was at that moment. If you had told me that I could be 100% happy when I was in prison at the hands of an enemy, I should never have believed it. But when I saw these uh, flames destroy these horrible papers, it was as if for the first time I understood Colossians chapter 2 verse 14, where it is written that Jesus has taken the handwriting of ordinances that was against us has taken them out of the way and nailed them at the cross. Oh man, I love how she, um, you know, in all the different situations that she's in, she's able to apply a scripture to his, her situation and uh, take comfort from it. Now there was a nurse that was kind enough to give Corrie a small concealable Bible. Now Corrie felt so blessed and comforted that she read from it as often as she could, even in the darkness. Of her cell. So, um, you know, as I think about the actions of this nurse, um, again, you know, very risky, but her act ended up being a great blessing to Corrie. You know, will that nurse ever know the impact of her actions? And do we recognize the great blessings we receive from God, um, the tender mercies of the Lord when they come to us? Yeah, so that was a great blessing. And as you'll hear um, later or soon, um, that that kind gesture of giving Cory um, a concealable Bible, not only was it able to bless Cory's life, but the life of hundreds of others. Okay, so Cory spent almost three months in solitary confinement. And then she was uh, she was taken to a waiting train where she was finally reunited with her beloved sister Betsy, um, and yeah, so they were taken into these trains, uh, these cattle carts. Uh, they didn't know where they were going. Uh, there wasn't much air or water in the carriage. And then days later, um, the train came to a stop. And they ended up working at a factory making radios for German aircrafts and because of their watch background um, they were used to this type of work and that concludes our diary reading for today thanks for tuning in and if you want your diary entry read on my channel please email them to Helen Hortai the diary reader at gmail.com this is Helen Hortai the diary reader signing out have a wonderful morning afternoon evening